Ladies and gentlemen, if I may have your attention, please, and if I can ask you to take your seats. Please grab your drinks, come on in, and let's start up. We're a few minutes late. Uh, as some of you may have heard, uh, there have been a full suite of votes on both the House and Senate sides uh, today, and so that has, uh, that's been a challenge, and really it's a testament to, uh, to the members who are here and uh, to Capitol Hill Ocean Week itself that, uh, that uh, members of Congress make such an effort to come to uh, the museum and join us for, for Chow 2014. Uh, the last session of the day is going to look at the role of the United States on the global stage. Uh, but before we go into the panel, and I invite the panelists to come up, it's my great honor to introduce Congressman Rob Whitman, who represents Virginia's first district and who serves on the Armed Services Committee and the Committee on Natural Resources. And looking at the discussion that we had in the last panel, and the discussion that we're having on this panel, I couldn't think of a more appropriate member of Congress to have. The last discussion, looking at coastal impacts, particularly with some of the questions that went to uh, the Rear Admiral on naval infrastructure and naval security along bases like uh, Newport News. Uh, nobody knows those issues better than the person who represents that part of the country in Virginia. And so uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Congressman Rob Whitman. Well, thank you. It's great to be here with you today. It's really a great opportunity and an honor. Wanted to share a little bit of perspective with you. As you know, we have lots of challenges concerning our oceans and our, our marine systems across the United States. And, you know, my background is in that realm. I, I cut my teeth working uh, for the state of Virginia as an environmental health specialist in my latter years, working specifically in the realm of marine science with uh, shellfish. I worked 18 years there monitoring water quality across the Chesapeake Bay, getting to understand lots of issues, as well as working, too, with managing the public health, health aspects of the marine fisheries there we have in Virginia. So great opportunity to learn a lot. And through my years of serving in public office, I found a great affinity to join good science with good public policy. Sometimes today that's lacking a little bit. I like to see science drive our public policy. I'd like to see more of that. That's one of the reasons why I put in, as soon as I got to Congress, a bill called the Chesapeake Bay Accountability and Recovery Act to make sure that there's transparency so we understand exactly where every penny is being spent on the Chesapeake Bay. That transparency, I think, is absolutely critical so we can properly manage those programs. We want to make sure, too, we understand what's happening with those dollars. Uh, much as we do in many other models, we want to make sure we have good feedback. We want to make sure that we are holding folks accountable so we can, so we can demonstrate results, especially today when resources are scarce. We want to make sure we can demonstrate to the public that when we expend those resources that we're showing results. That builds trust in the public. It builds trust in programs. It shows that we can accomplish things. It also shows that we are investing their tax dollars in things that make a difference, and especially with our environment. You know, we talk a lot about the Chesapeake Bay in the state of Virginia, and while we all know it is a national treasure, it has an intrinsic value, the real value is the economics, the value of what's in the bay, not just the marine resources, but the value, too, of how people enjoy the bay. And as we have a discussion about how do we make good public policy decisions on the environmental front, we have to make sure that we make those associations with the economic value of what we are enhancing or preserving and making sure that people understand that, that it's more than just an effort to say, let's do this for the good of the environment. It really is for the good of the economic health of the nation and of our ecosystems. And I believe very strongly in that, making sure that we project that economic importance and make sure, too, that we are able to demonstrate uh, achievable progress in improving and enhancing our natural resources, including our ecosystem so that people have faith in what we do and that they are willing to say let's put some dollars into that. It also too I think provides an opportunity to make sure that they are involved individually. You know we can do a lot in the larger context at the local state and federal government level but we also have to have buy-in from the public. We have to make sure that they are part of solving 
our problems. They have to be stakeholders in that effort. And the Bay is a great example. We can do a lot through the existing systems, but making sure that we have all those individuals that live in the Bay watershed, those now nearly 16 million people that live in the Bay watershed, we want to make sure that they are partners in that, that we have them as stakeholders. Doing that through showing that we can achieve progress on cleaning up the Bay is one of the ways that it's easier for us to get them involved because they feel like they are part of a bigger effort and that they are part of showing progress on cleaning up the Bay. So I think that's extraordinarily important, as well as other conservation programs. You know, as we talk about the scarce resources here in Washington, there are many efforts that have to continue. I have put forth the reauthorization of the North American Wetlands Conservation Act, which is a great story about how we leverage private dollars to do great things to preserve habitat, critical habitat. This habitat, as you know, is the, the linchpin to make sure that we preserve water quality, those wetlands. And obviously, they are a great habitat, too, as, as nurseries for all kinds of, of critters including our waterfowl, and I want to make sure that we continue to do that. The nice thing about the North American Wetlands Conservation Act is that for every dollar of public money we spend there, there are three dollars of private money that's spent also to preserve and set aside those wetlands in perpetuity, whether they're through easement or through fee simple purchase. Those wetlands are preserved forever, and the rate at which we're losing wetlands, that I think is extraordinarily important as well as the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which allows localities and states to determine how do we make sure that we are set aside critical habitat to make sure that we are preserving those areas in our states that we know are critical to our ecosystems. And that, I think, is another very, very important effort that we have to keep in mind because there are a lot of efforts to zero fund the Land and Water Conservation Fund. I think that's short-sighted. There's been some good reforms to the Land and Water Conservation Fund. As you know, for years, most of the money in the Land and Water Conservation Fund used to be earmarked. So it didn't go to necessarily the highest and best use of those lands that were being proposed to be set aside. Today, that earmarking has been set aside, which is a good thing. So it allows competition, it allows the highest and best use to, uh, to prevail in decision making as to where we put those dollars. So I think that's absolutely critical. When we talk about our fisheries resources, the Natural Resources Committee has been going through the markup of the Magnuson-Stevens Act, which is essentially the, the basic act that we use to manage marine fisheries around the United States. And that is critical also. One of the elements there that I think is, is absolutely important is making sure we devote the resources to develop good science with which to make management decisions. As you know, there are 538 different stocks of fish. Today, as we speak, we only have data to put in place in management plans on about 139 of those stocks. Uh, we can do more than that. We want to make sure that we have that information. We want to make sure, too, that we look at how those stocks fit within an ecosystem, so we look at how the pieces of that puzzle fit together, so we do things more holistically. We do a better job if we manage things holistically than if we're managing them individually and if we're not putting things in context about how one decision affects another, and also making sure that we're putting resources towards collecting what we need to make good management decisions. So the efforts we're putting forth in reauthorizing Magnuson-Stevens really gets us to that particular point. It makes it a better piece of legislation, and it assures that we can be successful in managing those fisheries. I think that's absolutely critical in how we put forth good public policy. And when we also include all the different sectors that are involved with this. We include the sport fishermen. We include the commercial fishermen. We include the public to say, how do we make sure that these decisions are made in the right way and including all of these different interest groups so that, again, that they're stakeholders. I think that's extraordinarily important. Another element about m marine resources is habitat, making sure they're preserving that habitat. And our National Marine Sanctuary Program is critical. As you know, here in the Mid-Atlantic, the marine sanctuary preserving the monitor is an extraordinarily valuable resource. And we are blessed here in the first congressional district to have the Mariner's Museum that is taking care of uh, the monitor as it's on its path to being preserved. And as you know, it's a long path to make sure that we, we keep it in its current state. Uh, but making sure that marine sanctuary continues to, uh, to be there in, uh, in the public 
preservation system, I think, is critical. And making sure we put forth the necessary resources. As you know, we've been through some, some roller coaster rides as far as the dollars for our marine sanctuaries. We need to continue uh, for those programs. I know there were some words earlier today from Mr. Podesta, making sure that we uh, are looking at other opportunities to enhance the marine sanctuary program. I think that's absolutely critical. Uh, as, as was pointed out, we want to make sure that it is indeed a community and state-based program to say, here's some, here's some things that are important to, to states and regions. How do we make sure we provide opportunities for those assets, those natural assets to be protected? Uh, the National Marine Sanctuary Program provides a great opportunity for us to do that. And again, I think the challenge for all of us these days is we know where the needs are, and they are many, and they are across the board. The challenge for all of us is how do we make sure we meet those needs within a very challenged environment of resources. And we all know that we have to get these things done. But I encourage all of you in the room to think creatively about how do we do that? How do we find those partners out there that share the same vision that we share? How do we make sure we engage them? How do we make sure that we get more than just their words? How do we make sure we get their resources? As I said, there's some great examples out there. Uh, the North American Wetlands Conservation Act has done a tremendous job in preserving habitat by engaging partners and saying, hey, would you put some resources towards this? That allows us in these times of scarce federal resources to take what we have and leverage that to a much greater extent and to do more and to do it at a pace that we know we need to do it. Many times, I'm sure you are like me, frustrated at the pace at which things are happening. We see the need and we see where we're able to meet the need. And many times that delta is significant. Uh, we have to think imaginatively and creatively to figure out how do we bring partnerships to the table? How do we bring resources to the table? How do we get things happening by actions on the ground to achieve what we all know we need to achieve? And whether that's through asking people to give of their treasure, which is important, but also get them to give of their time. That time is also a valuable resource in the things that we need to happen. So I want to make sure we're looking at ways to be able to do that uh, to achieve the things that we know we absolutely must achieve if we're to make sure that we have uh, healthy oceans, that we have healthy marine ecosystems, that we have healthy marine resources, which we all know are critical to the nation. It's a value to the nation. But as importantly, and as we have this dialogue, we have to encourage folks to understand the economic importance of all those. Because we know today that it's much easier for us to make the argument with someone to say, there's an economic value to, to this. And there's a greater economic value if we protect and enhance what we have here in our ocean and marine ecosystems and our marine resources. So thank you so much for having me today. I challenge you to help us find ways to make sure we, we leverage those resources, those human resources, those financial resources, and get people's time and treasure to do the things that I know that we can do as a nation to preserve and enhance the great resources that have been bestowed upon us and to make sure we preserve them for generations to come. Folks, thank you so much again, and may God bless each of you, and may God bless our great United States of America. Thank you. So thank you, Congressman. Uh, there are uh, very few members of the House who can speak with such authority, having a doctorate degree, having a master's degree, working in the field at the state level on these issues. Uh, and, uh, and we're very appreciative to have your support and your engagement on these issues. Uh, and uh, just for the record, the Congressman is a member of the House uh, National Marine Sanctuary Caucus. And so we're thrilled to have his involvement in that. Uh, with that, let me invite the panel to come up to the stage. And uh, it gives me my great pleasure to introduce the moderator of that panel, Monica Medina. Thanks. I think we're going to talk from our seats just to save time and to get more chance to um, have a good conversation. We're going to be relatively informal. Right. So um, Monica's gonna, uh, Monica deserves more of an introduction than that. I wanted to give them a chance to get settled. Uh, and, uh, and all of you uh, should get a reminder that uh, if you've got questions, uh, look for the volunteers going up and down the aisles. Uh, they'll have blank cards if you need, as well as pencils. Uh, have your questions come on up for the moderator. Uh, Monica uh, is someone I've had the pleasure and the honor of working for, at least for a brief time when uh, I was in the 
general counsel's office of NOAA, and Monica was uh, general counsel for NOAA. But in the years since, uh, and most recent, well, let me start uh, working from most recent back. Uh, Monica currently is with National Geographic Society as a senior director for Ocean Policy Advisor. Prior to that, Monica was uh, working with Secretary Leon Panetta as a special assistant. Uh, advising him on all issues concerning the environment, energy, climate change, and natural resource governance. Uh, and prior to that, she served as Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere at NOAA. Uh, Monica was with the transition team for the Obama administration in the beginning, and uh, we're delighted to have Monica here on stage for Chow 2014. And with that, I'll leave it to Monica to introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Jason, for that very kind introduction. You're too, you're too nice. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with this distinguished panel. Their uh, experience uh, is tremendous, and I know we'll have a great discussion. Let me introduce them quickly so that we can get into the discussion. Um, first, I have with us uh, Kathy Novelli, the Undersecretary of State for Energy, uh, for Economic Growth, Energy, and Environment. She's recently, she's new to the job. She's been there since uh, February of this year. Before that, she was the Vice President for Global Government Affairs for Apple, so we can thank her for our iPhones and our iPads <laughs> all working today. <laughs> we then have Chris Lashevsky, who's the CEO and President of Bumblebee Tuna, the largest seafood company in North America, and also a founder of the International Seafood Sustainability Coalition, a fine organization. Next, we have Chuck Fox, who's Program Director of Oceans 5, which is a collaborative of funders that work to create marine protected areas and reduce overfishing all over the globe. And last but not least, we have Clay Maitland, who's the uh, chairman and founder of the North American Marine Environmental Protection Association. And uh, it's not clear from all of that, which is a wonderful title, but he's an expert in global marine transportation. So we're lucky to have a great cross-section of uh, ocean interests here on the panel. Um, I think it's... Uh, you know, obvious to everyone that oceans connect everyone on the planet, even if they live in the most um, uh, landlocked country, every country in the world has an interest in and should care about conserving and protecting our oceans. Um, they're key to everything from transportation, food, commerce, security, climate, and of course, fun. Um, so I think we should have plenty to talk about, and with time being so short, let me kick it off by asking Undersecretary Novelli. The title of our, our panel discussion today is The U.S. on a Global Stage, and it just so happens that Secretary Kerry has called a global ocean conference for next week, which I know you're all aware of. So I wanted to ask you, what do you expect from the conference? What are you hoping to achieve? Well, thanks so much, and I must say it's an honor to be here with everybody and all of the experts on oceans, and it's such a privilege to get to work with the secretary who is absolutely passionate about this issue. Um, and so if you don't mind, I would love to show the secretary's call to action that he filmed um, and, and so that everybody can see it and hopefully act. Um, so I think someone is supposed to cue that up. The ocean covers almost three quarters of our planet, but our ocean today is at grave risk and the damage is not happening by accident. Human activity is the cause. Harmful fishing practices, even illegal fishing, giant garbage patches, hundreds of dead zones and rising carbon dioxide levels, all of it threatens life under the sea. That is the bad news. The good news is, it doesn't have to be that way. Governments, communities, and individuals can act now to reverse these trends. We can protect the ocean if we all start treating it like our ocean. Wherever you live, you can help in some way. There are things you can do to make a difference. Let's work toward a healthier ocean for this generation and those to come. Show your support and tell others how you'll make this commitment. Don't throw trash into our ocean or waterways. Ask for sustainable seafood. Volunteer at least one day a year to clean our waterways or beaches. I intend to ask our leaders around the world to act now to create a healthier ocean together, and we'll help lead the way. 
What will you do to help protect our ocean? Everybody will, um, because everybody who's here cares about the ocean, will join us. We are really trying to use social media to get the word out that people globally care about these issues. And we think it's very important that we involve in this conference every layer of, of society. So folks that are just regular people who can take those kind of actions that the secretary talked about, private industry. Uh, NGO community, scientists, and governments. And so we are aiming in this conference to bring all those layers of society together and look at three key areas, which is overfishing, pollution of the ocean, and ocean acidification. And there's lots and lots of topics that involve the ocean. We decided to try to focus on those three because we believe that those are areas where we can actually achieve concrete, tangible results. And that is what we are looking to do. We are bringing together um, people who have solved some of these problems or are on the way to doing this from all over the globe to talk about how they are solving these problems and how they're addressing them, and to help forge a consensus on what needs to be done from a practical perspective going forward, um, as well as to announce some things that, that people are committing to do, as well as the United States government. Um, in the immediate future. So we're looking at this as something that we can continue to use, not just a conference, a one-off, but instead to create a real movement towards more and more protection for the ocean in these areas and to set an agenda that can be used for the future as well as just for the conference. So we look forward to everybody participating either physically or virtually. It's going to be streamed live. Um, and we're going to have live feeds into all of the sessions so people can actually participate in an interactive way. And, um, and we look forward to tangible results. Thanks, Kathy. I think we're all hoping that uh, next week's conference uh, starts a wave of activity of, um, on the oceans to help conserve and to better govern them. Um, I think that is a key issue in the oceans, is governance globally. Um, the US, I think, as all the panelists are aware, is not a member of the Law of the Sea Convention. And I'm just wondering what you all think of that. I mean, is that a problem for the United States? And are there ways to get around whatever challenges that might create for each of you in your respective areas? Who would you like to hear from first? Maybe Chris? Yeah, you know, I, I think from, from our standpoint as industry and being part of an American industry, it, it's a little frustrating that our government won't take action. Um, when you look at a lot of um, global policy that's being developed around oceans and oceans health, quite often the U.S., the State Department, is actively involved in negotiating and developing that policy. And we're yet then the last government that actually approves such policy, if we approve it at all. And I think it really speaks for credibility. Um, you know, from an industry standpoint, it's not as big of an issue for, for my company because we're in a global industry. So we basically deal with global issues. But it's embarrassing when we are talking to other countries when our own government you know, that's involved in developing policies then doesn't pass it because we believe we have to protect our national sovereignty rather than recognizing the fact that oceans are something we all have to share rather than try to own. Chuck, did you have something you wanted to add, or Clay? Well, I, I would just simply echo it is a fundamental embarrassment. I spend probably uh, 20 to 30 percent of my time on the road in uh, international settings talking about ocean conservation. And the U.S. can take pride in being a leader on things like fisheries conservation. And I can't tell you how many RFMOs, for those of you that know the alphabet soup, where the U.S. is, in fact, a, a true leader on this. Um, the U.S. was a leader in negotiating some of the implementing agreements to love the sea. And yet here we are, stuck without um, having the Law of the Sea Treaty be ratified. Now, I will tell you this, as somebody who has spent some time in this town, until the situation changes in the Senate, I'm not sure it's worth a lot of our time and energy because we can just sit our, you know, spend our time knocking our heads against a brick wall. Clay. 
Uh, I think one thing, I'm a, I'm a former delegate to the Law of the Sea Conference. I actually was there from about 1976, in fact, from 1976 until 1982, when I was at the signing ceremony for it. For, you know, it's a little bit like saying you were a D-Day. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it was, uh, we were, we came away, and, I, and by 1982, there was a great head of steam behind the Law of the Sea Convention. And if you had told me that I would be here sitting with you today in 2014 in the United States is still one of the few nations of the world that has not ratified the convention, I would have just laughed at you. I wouldn't have believed it possible. But I am optimistic, and I tell you, I'm a little bit more optimistic than you are because having spent a lot of time in recent years in Alaska, uh, what has changed, I think, in this country is an increasing awareness that there is a big economic stake that we have not just in fisheries, not just in some of the other valuable byproducts of the oceans, but the fact that we, we are, Alaska is a part of the United States. Alaska is, has more seacoast, according to Alaskans. You ask the governor of Alaska, and they'll tell you, they have more coastline than the rest of the United States combined. I don't believe this, but that's what they say. Uh, they are developing more and more dependency as, as the population of Alaska grows. They still only have one congressman. Uh, in, in the oceanic future of that state, which is very different from the rest of us. They're the nearest state to Asia. They are a major trading partner of Asia, more than most of the rest of the United States. The Law of the Sea Convention has great many things in it, including not just environmental, which is my main concern, but also the right of innocent passage and all the things that make international trade really work. I think now, this should be emphasized a great deal more by our government and by our executive branch than it has been. And that, I hope, is a question that will come up during our brief time up here today, is how we can change the administrative burden in the United States of America so that we can promote not only the Law of the Sea Convention, but also the economic interests of Americans in getting the convention ratified. Thanks. You know, you've, you've touched on something that a couple of our audience members have asked questions. They've sent them up um, a, a, to, for me to ask you about um, how we can use um, our leverage in the marketplace, in fact, to uh, potentially solve the problem of illegal fishing. And I wonder if any of you, maybe Chris and Chuck and Clay, would like to comment on what they think um, we could do on the private sector side using market power or trade power to potentially solve that problem because illegal fishing, as Secretary Kerry noted, is an enormous problem that is hurting everyone um, who cares about food security in the world. You know, I, th I think the tuna industry has been a, a bit of a leader in this area in that tuna is a global commodity that swims around the ocean. And again, there's a lot of tuna that gets accused of being IUU, uh, especially some of the product going back to Japan and into China. And if you look at what I call the canning grade tuna industry, we've created an organization called the International Seafood Sustainability Foundation. And it's the first time I think you've seen industry partner with the environmental community, specifically WWF as our partner, and seven of the world's leading seafood scientists around the world. And today our membership represents about 70% of the global industry. And for things like IUU, we basically require all of the vessels we buy from have a registered, a unique vessel identifier number registered through Lloyd's of London. We don't allow transshipments on the high seas. We have 100% observers on all the fishing vessels. So we passed a number of resolutions to ensure full traceability of every fish that we buy back to the vessel that caught it. And again, when you represent 70% of the world's market and we're trying to great gain even a greater share, there is fewer and fewer loopholes for the bad actors to, to hide behind. I, I think this is a tremendous strategic opportunity uh, for the United States and the world. Um, you know, this might not be the same speech one would give in Thailand, but I can tell you that between the United States, EU, and Japan, that's probably getting close to 70% of the world's seafood market. And to the extent that we can set strategic um, uh, boundaries for how you enter these markets and make specific determinations about how we're going to make sure that we don't have IEU fish in here, we can in fact drive the world and lead the world. Uh, the EU alone is probably 40% of the world market. They had some really dramatic illegal fishing uh, regulations they passed several years ago, effectively mandating certification of all fish entering the EU market. And this has had 
dramatic effects throughout the world. I was two weeks ago in Central America, and they were all going through audits from the EU. And I think the United States is in a, a very unique position here to be a leader on this. Um, there have been a lot of leadership from the tuna industry in particular. You know, bluntly, that kind of leadership is not widespread throughout the seafood industry. I think the tuna industry is really much more of a leader on this one than others. But I think there's a lot that can be done here. If I may just add one thing, if I may. Uh, I agree completely with what's just been said, and I'm, I'm quite optimistic about what, uh, the, that approach. There are certain holes in the fence. Uh, they happen to be in uh, independent nations in the Pacific that once were UN trust territories administered by the United States. I'm referring to the waters of Palau, the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, and other island groups, some of which are still US territories. Uh, the independent countries that are what we call compact nations because they are treaty partners of the United States under what's called the Compact of Free Association with the United States, which was part of the means by which they became independent, depend on the United States of America for all of their resources in fisheries protection. They have very, very little in the way of assets of their own. Australia and the Pacific Forum nations are very helpful, but mostly under treaty it is the United States of America. That needs to be reviewed uh, by the House of Representatives and to some extent by the Senate to see how well that is working in terms of fisheries protection. I haven't seen very much on that in recent years. I get out to the Marshall Islands about twice a year. Uh, there's still a considerable amount of illegal fishing as that I hear of in that area. If you look at the sheer oceanic area covered by the Republic of the Marshall Islands alone, it's twice the size of the United States of America. And it's all water. I wanted to make one more comment here as a, a former uh, fisheries enforcer, and I see Jane Lubchenco, a former administrator of NOAA in the front row. I don't know, Jane, how many fisheries enforcement staff you had, but it was probably a couple hundred, something like that. And the reality, not even perhaps. Uh, when I was at the DNR secretary in Maryland, we had probably a couple hundred just for Chesapeake Bay waters. Um, the reality is that we will not, I don't believe, successfully enforce government alone to stop illegal fishing. One of the reasons that we've been so successful in this country in having clean air and clean water has been the way the pollution control laws are structured so that they are eminently transparent and the public has a right to know what is coming from smokestacks. And it becomes a, a, a form of deterrence that you don't get by just having government enforcement officials out there. And I think that's one of our challenges in the seafood sector is how do we make this much more transparent parent so that we get public deterrence. And maybe it's taking some leadership from the tuna sector where they have AIS signals coming from all their fishing boats. We have to think about this because we won't succeed in stopping IUU, I would argue, just by government enforcement alone. Kathy? Yeah, I would just like to add, I totally agree with that. And I think that um, part of the role that government needs to play is what, kind, what can we do to help provide the information that the private sector needs to be able to then trace things through and properly label, et cetera. And so to me, it's a real partnership that we need to have. And we need to have it in a way that's, that's going to empower the private sector to do the right thing um, and provide information to consumers so that when they ask the question, has my seafood been sustainably caught, we can reliably together provide an answer. That's great. So uh, picking up on, on some of what you've talked about here in terms of um, protections, wanted to turn to the big news of the, um, the conference of Chow this, this morning. Um, I understand that uh, uh, John Podesta was here and made an announcement about marine protected areas and opening up the process for uh, looking at new marine sanctuaries, which is wonderful news. So I wondered on the global scale, What's the role of marine protected areas, and are these um, important for conservation, for uh, our, our own marine heritage, our, uh, our future generations um, to be able to enjoy and understand exactly what a healthy ocean looked like? Kathy. Well, we, obviously, we think they're very important. Um, and um, we're working closely with John and others to, to work on that. And we're looking forward to the Oceans Conference. A number of countries are creating these. And so we have an opportunity to actually um, have some announcements made about that. Um, it's a tool in the toolbox. It's not the only tool. But just like we have national parks on land, we want to also create these preserved areas uh, in the sea as well. So we think they're extremely important. Chuck, I know you work on this all the time as well. So, 
Well, I, I, Kathy said it very well. You know, here in the United States, I think according to USGS, we have 15% of our terrestrial land protected. And on the marine side, of course, we all know it's a, a fraction of that. And then depending on how you define protection is a whole other thing. Um, you know, George Bush uh, really, I think, made a, a statement to the world when he created the uh, National Monument in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And we've seen governments around the world follow suit um, and some surpass. And we've seen some at smaller scale that are, are much more um, you know, perhaps tailored to some of those local needs. I think what Secretary Kerry is doing with this conference and inviting some of these other foreign leaders in, this is delightful. And we're going to see, I think, more and more challenges issued to these governments to get involved. I know foundations like mine um, were involved in probably a half a dozen places around the world, including Russia in the, in the Arctic. And there are unique opportunities in all of these places to advance these concepts. I think it's always important, though, to define it in terms that it's for the benefit of those local communities and their future generations. And there's always really good arguments to be made. If I might just add to that, I just came back from Greece. As a matter of fact, I'm just jet lagged. The biggest shipping conference in the world, private sector, is in Greece every two years. And it's an exercise in sleep deprivation, but you learn a lot. The European Union, the European Commission, is doing a great deal in this area now. They really are kicking, I think, into high gear. Uh, particularly in the Mediterranean, which has been a very neglected area and, and a, an endangered area for a in a lot of ways. They have a, a, a not only marine sanctuaries, but they're trying to preserve you know, the, the relics of earlier civilizations as well as the natural environment there. But it's a very, very big deal. What I think we need to look at is the extent to which the United States and Canada, naming North America, is partnering with the EU. I'd like to see more of that because, as, as, as I think you just said, the degree to which we can build a global critical mass where we're working together with not only certain progressive Asian nations, such as China and, and, Japan, and definitely Japan, definitely South Korea, definitely Australia and New Zealand, but also the European Union. Uh, we can get a great deal of, of consensus support for exactly what you're just describing, which is a, a, uh, a global approach. I think you use the word global, and I, that is something that NAMEPA and the other MEPAs, there are a family of our organizations around the world which, which involve private sector uh, companies. That's what we need to do. It's not good enough to just do it in the United States. Chris. I might argue on the nature of the progressive <laughs> countries you just mentioned, but aside from Recent events. We look at it a little bit differently from the standpoint. We fully support marine, marine protected areas that are scientifically justified. You take places like Galapagos or atolls or the Australian Reef, where there's indigenous species that need to be mm. protected. But for instance, in our industry, we fight with certain folks in the environmental community that want to just close off big swaths of the ocean. Why? Well, just because. Of the and high seas. On the high seas, just because that means there will no, be no fishing taking place. And, and let's be clear, fish still represents a huge amount of the protein yeah, we eat it. <laughs> that's consumed in the world. And you know, you look at our industries, tuna is a highly migratory species. So if you close a part of the ocean, I'll just wait right there for it to swim through. So why did we close it? So again, when it's scientifically justified and you're trying to protect specific species or specific um, monuments, fully supportive, but just to arbitrarily close parts of the ocean, we don't support. Great. Thanks for that. Um, let me turn to a question that several members of the audience have, have uh, posed, which is um, the Arctic. What should the US's role be in the Arctic? There's something called the Arctic Council, for those of you watching out there who aren't as aware. It's a group of nations, uh, Arctic nations, who get together on a regular basis. There's a rotating chair. And the US will become the chair of this Council of Nations in the Arctic region in 2015. So the question for the panelists from the audience is, what do you think the US should do with that chairmanship? And how should we be active or engaged in the Arctic, since it is part of uh, you know, our, our ocean, and yet also global, a key area of the globe. Kathy. Well, obviously, um, the Arctic is changing. And I think that's one of the things that we have to acknowledge. And I think we need to work together on policy that is going to both preserve the Arctic and recognize that there is not now a completely frozen mass. And so we have people who, countries who really want to do shipping, we have uh, fishing, we have natural resources, and 
the question is, how can we learn from what we've been doing in the past and chart a course in the Arctic that is going to make sure that the Arctic is protected at the same time recognize that there is going to be some development that takes place there. And how do we do that? And how do we balance the, the whole idea of preserves where nothing happens with the, um, the ability to have some things happen, but happen in a way that are going to be least impactful? Can I speak to that for a yes, second? Yes, of course. I'm sorry. I, I'm also reading the next questions that are coming up. Go ahead, please. I just play. came back. I, I get to, to Alaska a lot, and uh, we work, uh, one of NEMEP's functions is we work with the Coast Guard a lot. There is a, 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 a marine passageway, actually a highway, uh, between the Bering Sea and the Northern Pacific called the Nunavak Pass, which goes through the uh, Aleutians. Many people in the shipping and the fisheries industry are very familiar with it. Right now, the Coast Guard tells us that they do not have a very clear idea of how many ships are going through there. Uh, the actual traffic that is going through from the Bering Sea to the Northern Pacific, and we're not talking about fishing vessels as much as we are about commercial ships, uh, because it is a short, the Great Circle route to the you know, West Coast ports like Long Beach, California, Seattle, and the West Coast of, of uh, uh, um, Canada. Prince Rupert is a growing port, moves through that area. Uh, this pre presents certain uh, environmental risks by its very nature. And there have been a number of well-publicized casualties involving large ships, car carriers, tankers, and the like in that area. Because of the weather conditions, look at the kind of satellites that we have that can actually monitor this traffic are actually quite limited. We need certain things. And of course, unfortunately for all of us, they involve the spending of money, uh, government money. We only have one functional icebreaker, by the way, in the entire world. That's all the United States has. Right now, it's down. I think it's still in the Antarctic, because we've got National Science Foundation has major projects in the Antarctic. We need three major icebreakers. Before the recent uh, unpleasantness with uh, Mr. Putin, it was contemplated by the Coast Guard that we, would, we, the United States of America, that is to say our government, would charter several of the Russian icebreakers. Uh, obviously, that plan is no longer exactly being welcomed in Washington. Uh, we need to build them. These cost billions of dollars. The billions of dollars are not there, we're told, for that. But in order to do what we're talking about here, reflecting the questions that you have, there is a need for government spending. There is a need for hardware. Uh, we used to have five or six major icebreakers. We're down to one elderly icebreaker now. I think it's the Polar Sea. Uh, and if you go to Seattle, that's where the other icebreaker is, and it's like an old car in the backyard rotting away. The pieces of it are on the dock in Seattle. You drive by on the highway, and you can see them. That's where we are as a country. We've allowed the infrastructure that we need to do what we need to do in the Arctic to really rot away. That's only one example. The other is satellites. We need to be able to look down and see what is happening along the, in these very sensitive environmental areas. And we are not doing that. We don't have the money. The Coast Guard is greatly overstretched if you go up there to Elmendorf Air Force Base and visit them. I'm sorry to go on, but that's where the problem we've got. It's a very real one. I can see the Alaska delegation nodding. If they're all watching out there on I hope the they live are. stream, they're, they're, they're nodding the two senators. In, in violent agreement. <laughs> Um, let me turn to a, a, a question that you sort of hinted at your, in your last answer, which is new technologies and the potential for new technologies to change um, ocean governance, ocean management, um, just all our actions, our activities on the ocean. Um, maybe Chuck or Chris or Clay, if you could talk about the potential for new technologies, <laughs> maybe in helping to combat illegal fishing or to helping to be ready for what hopefully will not happen anytime soon, but you know the, the inevitable times when we need technology to save us in the event of ocean oil spills or the like, um, transportation you know problems. You know, it's. Um it becomes cliche to say how fast technology is changing, but it, it really is amazing. Um, Kathy, you must have seen it firsthand. Um, you know, speaking as a civilian here, just sticking to civilian data, 
um, the reality is that uh, you know, we all can find out exactly where any vessel is at any time today for peanuts. I mean, it's nowhere near the cost that we used to have to pay for VMS data to go to satellites and do all of this. You now got AIS data, which is probably the cheapest. It's a VHF radio connection um, for a small you know, recreational vessel. You could probably do it for 70, 100 bucks. For a big commercial vessel, it might be a couple thousand dollars or even less. And that data only goes line of sight, but you have satellites that can pick up that data. And you could, in fact, create real-time uh, maps today of where every fishing vessel is at any time. Most of the tuna sector have AIS transponders on it. The EU already requires AIS transponders to be on. And one interesting thing, coming back to my enforceability comment earlier, under US law, under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, uh, VMS data, different kind of data, is actually shielded from the public. And in fact, I think it's a felony for a no employee or any federal employee to give that data to the public. AIS data is it's, you know, public domain. Anyone can get it. And that's just one example of the kind of changes in technologies that I think can make the management of the oceans a whole lot easier. It, it, it's, you know, for our industry, it's also a source of frustration because, as mentioned, the, the technology is all there. Every vessel out there pretty much has a vessel monitoring system on it. Because if you're an owner of a vessel sitting in the port, you want to know where your vessel is. There's transponders all over. There's satellite technology. So literally, and we're experiencing now even with things like electronic observers. So rather than look for a human observer, we can see when the what fish is coming and what's being caught, what's being discarded. We know just by watching a vessel's RPMs, whether they're setting on a school of fish or just... So all the information is available. And it's so easy to correlate and bring together, and yet there continues to be tremendous resistance. And, and again, it's not so much amongst industry as it is governments. Of government, the one the one point is for industry to say you have to have this, but industry can't necessarily enforce. And and again, I do think the U.S. is a leader in this area. In fact, if you look at our domestic fleets, we all have these kinds of requirements. But you look at some of the global fleets and. We'll get excuses from some extremely technically developed countries say, well, we don't really have the technology to do this. And you just kind of, you're baffled. You say, you guys have developed this technology. So it's frustrating. It's all there. It's easily implementable. But there's got to be global will. And there's just, there's a small number of bad players that basically hold back the marketplace. Well, that's one of the reasons why I think the Arctic Council, which has been mentioned, is very important. It's an intergovernmental organization. Uh, it's a mini UN of well, countries. How about the IMO? The IMO, which I'm very involved in. Uh, let me the tell you. The International Maritime Organization. Yeah, Sorry it's for it's the, the United soup. Nations Maritime Agency, which is headquartered in London. It moves slowly. Uh, it had its beginnings after World War II in, in a non-enforcement role. And unfortunately, many governments still see it as consultative rather than non not one that has teeth but it did produce the Marpol Convention, which is the Marine Pollution Convention, after the major oil spills like the Amoco Cadiz in 1979. So they are the best technical body in the world on oil spills. But we haven't had big oil spills, touch wood, since the Exxon Valdez in, in, in 89. That's a testimony to the success, first of all, of our own Oil Pollution Act in this country, which doesn't get a very, a very much of a fair shake, but was the product of the United States Senate after Exxon Valdez. That's what we sometimes call Open 90. It's a big success. The IMO is a big success. But the pollution problems we have now have changed. They're not oil-based except from the land. Yeah, we got a lot of oil problems, but they're coming off the land. They're not so much coming from the ships anymore. Uh, emissions control. The shipping industry is way ahead of land-based sources in terms of controlling emissions and, and throttling down on it. Right now, the American shipping industry is rapidly converting to gas-propelled vessels. That's the great technological change we haven't mentioned. And you're seeing that now with the US flagships on the Pacific Coast, which are rapidly being converted. The new builds that are being built are actually going to be published, uh, pu uh, propelled by liquid natural gas. That's a much cleaner fuel, and if we can promote that, it'll change the, the emissions control problems for ships. The problem is on land, which we haven't talked about, have we? It's the runoff from, I don't know if the congressman is still here, from his district and other districts, agricultural runoff, plastics, uh, and everything coming down the Mississippi River system. The biggest problem we see in the Gulf of Mexico now is not coming so much from oil well blowouts, oh, that's a serious, terrible, terrible problem in that one case. 
Uh, but what's coming down the Mississippi River system and, and contaminating and destroying the, the shellfish beds to the extent that it is, that is something we haven't really addressed. And it's a very, very hard thing to do. I don't know how to do it. I think there's another panel that's going to tackle that one. <laughs> but I, I understand your point and agree with it. Kathy, I wanted to ask you quickly to jump in here and say if you could predict, given your history with um, Apple, how long it will take technology to sort of get there in terms of iPhones and connectivity with oh. law enforcement. Is it five years, do Ten you minutes. think, or is it longer, maybe less? Oh, way less. I think it's way less. Yes. And even, even you know, one of the things that we're looking at for the Oceans Conference is uh, an, an app that will help artisanal fishermen know how to fish today on their phone. Um, so that they would know, okay, it's okay, there's a school here, it's okay to go after that one because of these reasons. So um, uh, people are, are doing that kind of thing right now. And also in terms of uh, the whole ocean acidification, now they're, we're trying to get an entire uh, wave of buoys that have all the technology to monitor how the ocean acidification moves around so that shellfish farmers can protect their shellfish and take adaptive measures. And that isn't built out yet, but the technology's there. So I think this is today, right now, that we can get there. That's great. I hope, I hope that's right, um, because I do think there are lots of solutions to be had. And we probably haven't even touched the, you know, scratched the surface on on what's possible. Um, I wanted to ask each of you uh, if you could comment on what you think the government, the one thing the government could do to improve ocean conservation and ocean, um, ocean uses globally, and what's the one thing that either individuals or the private sector, your company, your organization could do to help um, conserve or, or better manage our oceans? Well, we are encouraging um, we have just joined the Port State Measures Agreement, which we think is going to be a great tool. Uh, and we need to have implementing legislation from the Congress for that. So we hope that we'll see that soon. Uh, and we are encouraging uh, other governments to join. We need a critical mass of 25 countries to, uh, to actually bring this into force. There's 11 right now. So we don't know if we'll get up to 25 at the Oceans Conference, but we tend to really push this forward to give us the tools we need and everybody the tools they need. And what sorts of things are you hoping individuals will do? I know Secretary Kerry actually hinted at that, clean a beach, right. uh, don't throw plastic in the ocean. Or any pollution, right. And ask if you're, and only eat sustainably caught seafood. And so we're trying to have things that people can do that they can actually do. Um, not everybody is going to be, uh, you know, a, a marine biologist or, you know, work in a, a company uh, that's doing wonderful things like Bumblebee. So, you know, what can individuals do? And so we set on those three things as very simple actions that can make a huge difference. Chris, how about you? What do you think you can do to help get your industry more bought in? And what would you like the, the U.S. government to do to help globally? Right. Uh, we do a couple of things locally. Uh, we uh, recently were invited to join the Joint Oceans Commission's initiative, um, which Dr. Lubchenco is on as well, which, which is a, a broad group of folks, former government, academia, industry. We've joined the Oceans Caucus Foundation here in Washington to really try to educate our Congress, because a lot of the oceans issues aren't bipartisan. And my God, in our Congress, you know, I'm sorry, you know, depending on which house you're, side of the house you're on, you vote against what the other side of the house puts forward. And if we can't speak with the common voices of the U.S. government, so as companies, we're trying to put pressure on our government to come together and really support what industry is supporting. Uh, and I think if the U.S. has a common voice, it makes us much stronger in the international arena. Uh, I think as companies, you know, Sustainability, it's very tough to make it a consumer issue because it's very confusing. So we actually work very closely with our retailers, the Kroger's, the Walmarts. Um, you know, all the big retailers are really pushing sustainability because at the end of the day, we can't ask a customer to walk into a grocery store and try to look at 10 different labels and figure out which one's sustainable. They depend on that grocer that the Walmart has done their job in ensuring the products they carry are sustainable. So we work very closely with our retailers not only on education, but to give them the credence and the audit results and the work that we do to ensure that if they're buying our products, they can meet the sustainability requirements that their consumers expect. Do you think the fact that a lot of the seafood goes from where it's caught to a processor to back offshore to, 
the, the sort of how mobile the seafood is as it's caught and then processed and brought to market is a problem, or is it? Is it, it it's only a problem. It's only a problem if you're buying from a from a processor that doesn't have the controls. Any one of our customers, anytime, can ask for full traceability. If you take a can off, we don't just do tuna. We're in salmon, sardines, herring, you name it. But if you just give us the code off the top of the can, I can trace it back exactly to the fishery the vessel it came from. And if a processor can't do that, you shouldn't be buying from them. So again, it's very easy to basically trace fish if you're a responsible processor. Um, I suspect that if I were to come up with one single thing, the most important, it would be to tackle illegal fishing. Because illegal fishing, it's not something that's just 20% is the best estimate for globally, and in some fisheries or regions it could be as high as 40%. It's not just that, which is bad. It actually, in my opinion, undermines the integrity of all fisheries management systems. You know, if you're sitting around the table at ICAT, trying to get people to put forth on the table some actual real conservation reductions in your, you know, Libya or Brazil or the EU for that matter, why are you going to offer some reductions in your catch if you know the illegal guys are just going to come in and take it? And so the reality for me is it's we don't have yet the integrity of a management regime internationally. And to me, going after IUU would be one of the first most important things to do. And I think you've got to be bold. And, and I, I know Kathy knows this, um, but I think, you know, particularly in the United States, we're at a key point here where we have an opportunity to lead in setting uh, some true transparent mechanisms in place to tackle illegal fishing. Let me just say, we were given a few extra minutes, so... Um, One point. Yes, go ahead. just want to tell you, Namepa, we, we specialize in education, mostly remote education starting in the lower grades. Uh, that's something that can be done around the world. Uh, through teaching, uh, the Jason Project in this country, which uh, GW has been very involved in, Dr. Steve Cohen, who I think is here today, has been very involved in, uh, the, J the Jason, in fact, he wrote his PhD thesis, I believe, on Jason. If we get more, the, the consensus that needs to be built, that we have all been talking about for the last hour, and I suspect everybody has been talking about all day, and we'll be talking about next week, that begins with the schools, frankly, in the United States, Canada, and around the world. The achievement of what we, the goals that we seek, depends on public opinion, and it depends on political will. Political will from Congress comes from public opinion. The representatives that we elect will listen to what we say to them, and that comes through education. Beach cleanups, which we also do, are very much a part of that. Simple little thing like that. But that, getting the word out, teaching young people and, te and having teachers talk about the gyre, plastics contamination, the islands of plastic trash, in the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. When they see that, when they know about that, that is a tremendous driving force in public opinion. Which other countries do you think, in your experience, are leaders as well? I mean, obviously, we, we think the US, uh, we think of ourselves as a leader, despite the fact that we haven't ratified the convention. But we lead on fisheries, on marine transportation protections. Um, Canada, uh, the Scandinavian countries, uh, the northern European countries to a degree, I don't think, I don't want to belabor that point because I realize there are some that don't. Uh, there are the laggards that are the ones that are the biggest concern. I would answer this question, and, and um, I, I, I don't have it at my fingertips, but this is a very easy data-driven answer that you can give. And you can look at which countries are hitting MSY on fisheries management, for example, and which ones aren't. And sadly, I would respectfully disagree with my colleague here to my left about Canada. Um, you know, I think what we've seen is countries like the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Norway, Iceland, these are all countries that have implemented strategies to basically get you on a path to maximum sustainable yield. The United States is a true leader in this, um, and a lot of it was because of what Jane Lipchenko did at NOAA in implementing the Magnuson Act. But today, the challenge is really, I would argue, in these smaller scale, mid-latitude countries and fisheries. An important statistic for everybody to keep in mind is that 90% of the world's fishermen are in Asia. And you know you can't go after world fisheries problems without focusing on Asia. And I do agree with you on that. Even if you disagree with me, I do agree <laughs> with you on that. And, and I'm going to answer it again just a little bit differently. I look at it rather than which countries are doing well, it's which countries make a difference. And right now, US, EU, Japan, China, Korea, and Taiwan. I'll let you decide which one of those are responsible or not. But if you could get those six countries, those six groups of countries, to agree both on controlling what comes into their markets 
and what their fishermen do, you solve 90% of the problem. And the EU problem might actually be not the EU in all member states, it might only be two member states. So, so again, I, I think it, it's pretty concentrated, and yet trying to get those groups to agree. You know, they, they may outwardly have policies that make sense, but there's zero enforcement behind them. And, you know, without enforcement, you don't have management. So is that something that can be tackled by the private sector? Is there an opportunity for the private sector to help with the enforcement problem by um, either through vessel tracking mechanisms or um, creating its own um, ability to help identify the vessels that are causing the problems? I mean, yes and no. I mean, I, I think both the U.S. and the EU as big markets are doing a good job of controlling. The EU is way ahead of us on their IUU regulations coming in. The U.S. Is, looks like it's making progress. And, and as industry, you know, I think we do a pretty good job of controlling what we buy. But, you know, Japan is far behind the world in terms of, of, of implementing responsible policy. And so, so much fish flows into that market. If they're not part of a global solution, then there's a loophole. China, it's a huge market. And whatever doesn't flow into our markets, if we're now putting such strict rules in place for entry to the U.S. and the EU, do you think they care? They'll just go to China. So you know, if you don't get all of these countries that not only dominate fishing, but control the market, then you always have loopholes to jump through, and that's the challenge. I don't think we can divorce the overall uh, environmental crisis that involves our ocean and afflicts our oceans and treat it separately from fisheries. I think it's all part of one major problem and it needs to be looked at holistically. The United States, for, I agree, is the leading and driving force whether or not we ratify the Law of the Sea Convention. But we've got to be able to deal with not just fisheries, we've heard a lot about fisheries, but also about the other contaminants and pollutants that very frankly are destroying, helping to destroy our fish stocks. Not everything that happens with our fisheries is due to catch. A lot of it is due to what we're putting into the oceans. And I would just add, I, I think, you know, we also think it's really important, taking up your point about education, that we reach out to the, regu to the general public because the more the public is educated and the more the public's voice is heard politically by all the countries who need to be better actors, where the public is demanding that certain things be taken, for those who want to do the right thing, it gives them the political space to do that. And for those who are being recalcitrant, it pushes them in the direction of, of doing the doing what they should be doing. And so I think that is an absolutely vital piece of all this, and that's why we're trying to do so much social outreach. So we only have a couple minutes left, and I just want to ask each of you to look forward 10 years and tell me what do you think our global oceans look like? Have we solved some of these problems, or are we still having the same discussion? I'll start with Clay. I'll, I'll work my way back this way. I think, looking ahead in, in uh, my non-existent crystal ball, we're going to see a situation which is similar to what we have today. I don't think we're going to make terribly much progress on, for example, contamination of the oceans by plastics and chemicals. I think we are going to make considerable uh, progress in protecting global fisheries. And my colleagues here may disagree with me, but I think that there is an increasing will to save, frankly, our food stocks as well as our fish stocks. That is true. I think I would not be surprised, frankly, if the United States does finally ratify the Law of the Sea Convention. Maybe too late in the day, to, maybe we need to do a lot with it. It's getting a little bit rusty, but I think that's going to happen. I, um, I, we have to be optimistic. And so I'm going to say that, um, you know, that the world is successfully reframing fisheries conservation as not about the health of the ocean, but about feeding the world and about maximizing economic returns. We know from the Magnuson Act that not only are our fish uh, more sustainably managed, but our fishermen are making more money because of it. And I'm going to be optimistic and say that this trend of reframing these issues is going to change global fisheries management. Having said that, I was last weekend out in the Chesapeake Bay, a place I love, and working with Congressman Whitman years and years ago. And they are now marketing uh, Chesapeake Bay
cow nose rays before they have any management plan for them. And we are repeating the exact same fisheries management problems that we have repeated over and over and over and over and over in this country and in other countries for hundreds of years. We see it in Pacific tuna. We all know we have to manage the capacity and capacity is still going up. We see it in the Indian Ocean. So we, we know the answers, but we still have to find a way to organize ourselves politically, socially to get to that end point. I'd say the same way. It's, you know, I'm, I'm proud of what we've accomplished in, in North America and in the EU and the direction that we're going. Uh, it's just very difficult for me to be optimistic in the next five to 10 years in Asia. I'm not, and I'd like to be. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of talking and uh, not a lot of action over there. And so, I don't know. Um, that, to me, is we'll the see. $6 million question. Kathy. I think we need to continue to reframe the discussion. Um, and the economic arguments are just completely compelling, including in Asia, where folks are looking at trying to grow their economies and feed their people. And I think if, as we reframe that, that's going to help us push things forward on that. And I also would say I wouldn't count out technology on the pollution issues. I, I think that those are solvable problems. And I think part of it is just what's the will to, to do that and to think outside the box. And we're hoping we can engage some, some folks in the science world and the business world to think outside the box on those things. Well, I will add um, my last note of optimism that uh, hopefully on top of the technology and market forces and uh, will, that there will also be marine protected areas all, all over the world that will provide nursery grounds and that hopeful um, baseline for the future so that we can know what we have in our oceans. We won't just have lost them. So I want to thank the panelists. Jason, thank you very much for having us. Thank you. So uh, I too want to thank Monica for moderating, and uh, I'll thank the panelists as well. Uh, Kathy, Chris, Chuck, and Clay, this is the C panel, and certainly they allowed us to see some things on the U.S. playing a role on the international stage. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors and our partners once again. Again, we can't put on Capitol Hill Ocean Week without all of the help that we get. And uh, that, of course, looks internally at the staff and the volunteers that we have. Really just a wonderful, dedicated team that work particularly hard in the run-up to Chow, particularly hard during the week, and uh, certainly for many months in advance to make sure that we have uh, a wonderful conference. And uh, lastly, I want to thank all of you as a wonderful, engaged audience, particularly for the extra few minutes that we wanted to borrow this afternoon to close this session. And I look forward to more engaging discussions and, uh, and all of you here. 8.30, we open the doors, grab your coffee, grab your tea, and we will start up at 9 a.m. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.